The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the AVPN webinar on impact measurement and management with Agenda Lens. My name is Roshni Prakash, and I'm the Director of Knowledge at AVPN. We're very glad that you are able to join us today. To start off, I'd like to give you a brief overview of today's webinar flow. I will begin with a brief introduction of AVPN and discuss our current work in the gender lens investing space. I will then hand over to our first speaker, Lisa Glasgow, Manager on the Global Impact Investor Network's IRIS Plus and Impact Measurement and Management team, who is working on the development on IRIS Plus and related measurement strategies. Lisa will speak on the IRIS Plus framework and demonstrate how it helps investors translate their intentions into measurable impact. She will illustrate this with the development of core metrics for investments in Agenda Lens. Lisa will be followed by Bob Webster and Ingrid Chow of C, the Small Enterprise Assistance Funds, which is an investment management group that provides growth capital and business assistance to small and medium enterprises in emerging and transitioning markets. One of CIF's impact themes is women's economic empowerment and gender equality, around which it has realized significant advancements in the past three years. Bob is the Chief Operating Officer at CIF, as well as a member of CIF's Global Investment Committee and its Women's Economic Empowerment Team. Ingrid works closely with CIF's executive team, primarily focusing on fund formation and CIF's Global Women's Economic Empowerment and Gender Equity Efforts, Gender Equality Efforts, excuse me. Today, Bob and Ingrid will talk about how CIF measures gender equality within pipeline and portfolio companies using its scorecard, while also describing its overall gender lens investing thesis, its current gender lens investment vehicles, and some highlights from Southeast Asia. CIF is a member of the GIN and its gender lens working group. I thank you all for being here with us today and for sharing your wealth of experience and expertise with everyone on the call. Following the presentations, we will have about 20 minutes for Q&A. And then I will close this webinar with some summarizing remarks. Before I con continue, some housekeeping rules. Please feel free to use the console to type in your questions during the presentations. I will raise all questions to our speakers after both presentations are done. If you have further questions that are not answered by the end of the webinar, you can email avpn at knowledge at avpn.asia. AVPN is a unique funders network committed to building a high-impact philanthropy and social investment community across Asia. Currently, we have over 600 members across 33 markets, and we are very pleased that two of our members, Jin and Sif, are speaking today. Gender inequality is a critical social and economic issue not only around the world, but also in Asia. It is also one that offers multiple approaches for capital deployment. This could include investing in women-owned or led enterprises, investing in enterprises that promote workplace equity, for example, in staffing, management, boardroom representation, and along their supply chains, or investing in enterprises that offer products or services that substantially improve the lives of women and girls. This diversity is important to note as it illustrates the range of gender lens investing opportunities and the investment readiness of the landscape in order to fuel more inclusive economic growth and the building of equitable societies in Asia and beyond. Along with our members, AVPN recognizes the pressing socioeconomic need for more capital to be mobilized towards gender causes and we are therefore working on gender as an area of thematic focus. Our specific goal is to increase the amount of social investment capital that applies a gender lens to solve the challenges faced by women and girls across the Asia Pacific region. We aim to achieve this goal by encouraging cross-sector collaboration and promoting best practice 
in order to strengthen the effectiveness of practitioners and increase the impact of initiatives around this issue. Genderlens Investing is part of our efforts to take a deeper dive into these issues by drawing on our network to break down the barriers and mobilize more capital into gender solutions. We are partnering with Investing in Women, an initiative of the Australian government to increase our gender lens investing activities. We are also working with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to explore the need for a network of gender champions in the region. With session, sessions like this webinar, we hope to introduce gender lens investing to a wider audience and interlink it with relevant adjacent concepts. And moving forward today, this will be exactly our focus, answering the question of how to align impact measurement and management frameworks with a particular investment strategy like gender lens investing in order to measure impact effectively. On that note, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for today. Representing Jin, we have Lisa Glasgow. Over to you, Lisa. Uh, you should now have control of the presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the AVPN team for, for hosting this webinar. I'm very excited to be speaking. Um, let's see. Having trouble clicking. Um, I'm sure it'll warm up in a second. Um, what I'd like to speak about today, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of context on the gin and about our work and our goals. But then what I'd like to talk about is Iris Plus. Um, and I'll do that by setting up a little bit of context around uh, impact measurement and management within the industry itself. And then I'll go a little bit more specifically into what Iris Plus is and um, how it works. And AVPN team, I'm having a little bit of trouble flipping to the next slide. Um, if, ah, there we go, okay. So, so yes, we'll talk about these things. So to give a little bit of context on the Global Impact Investing Network, also known as the GIN, we are the global champion of impact investing. And our goal is to increase both the size and the effectiveness of impact investing around the world. And for that, we're, we're glad to be partnering and, and lucky to be partnering with folks like AVPN who do similar work. Um, we aspire to create a world in which social and environmental factors are integrated regularly into investment decision making. So instead of thinking about investment decisions from a traditional financial standpoint and then thinking about uh, social and environmental impact, um, we're driving towards a world in which all investments think about those two pieces at the same time. And just to level set on what an impact investment is, though this is a pretty familiar crowd, impact investments are made with the intention to generate a positive social environmental return alongside a financial return. So really both of those impact and financial elements are critical to an impact investment. So to give a little bit of context before I dive into IRIS Plus more specifically, well, I'm going to pull a couple of data points from our 2017 State of Impact Measurement and Management Practice report. Um, these are uh, drawing from respond responses from 169 impact investors. I'll also note that we are just about to release a new uh, a second edition of this report with significantly more impact investor uh, insights and responses. So look forward to that in just a couple of months. For now, though, I'll pull from this report. Um, this is, I think, an incredibly illuminating um, chart from that study. And what it's showing here is areas where respondents felt that the impact invested industry had seen either significant progress or significant challenge within the past couple of years. And you'll see at the top that when we asked this question in 2017, what we learned was that many of the respondents felt that uh, the industry had made incredible progress in, um, in the sophistication of understanding of impact measurement and management. So whether it was the investors and the donor understanding of uh, best practice and reporting, or simply the sophistication of the tools and methodologies available, there was a feeling that the industry had made great progress in that space. What you'll see though, is that the biggest number on that chart, that 50%, 
is a challenge. And respondents here felt that the biggest challenge in the space was actually addressing fragmentation in impact measurement and management approaches. So the, the sentiment here is that though the, the industry has um, created great sophistication over the past couple of years, that has led to so many different approaches that it's difficult often to keep track of them all. We also found in surveying them that a couple of more specific investor level challenges um, continued to create trouble for folks. Um, one was simply collecting quality data, so knowing where to get data, how to collect it, um, and how to use it. But then also quite a bit around what are appropriate impact metrics? How do we gather that data and then analyze it across a portfolio? And how do we use those insights generated to make decisions based on impact data? And so I'll bring in IRIS now and why we created it. IRIS was originally developed in its, its earlier form in 2009. So it's been around for about uh, 10 years at this point. And in that original version, its, its goal was to create a common language for impact. Um, so it brought together metrics and indicators from a number of different spaces. And whether you were investing in agriculture or clean energy or affordable housing or health, there was one common place to find the standard way of talking about that impact, those goals and those that progress. What we started hearing in about 2017, though, was that investors were now facing a number of challenges on top of simply knowing where to get the best metrics. And, and this is roughly what we learned in speaking to them. We heard about three key pain points. First was that there was a lack of implementation guidance. So there were the SDGs and broad agreement on conventions and principles, but no clear instructions on how to implement them at the investment level. There was also a lack of agreement around which metrics were the right ones. And because of that, there was a lack of comparable data on which to benchmark targets. And then finally, there was continued confusion and fragmentation within the space. So um, at the time we cataloged about 150 tools, we're now up to 300. And that, that kind of progress in numbers shows you how quickly and how frequently there are new tools available on the market. And it can be quite difficult to figure out which ones are right for your goals and which ones are best practice. So we learned these things, um, and then we started speaking to even more stakeholders. So you'll see a, a couple of folks here that we spoke to. Um, it is difficult to fit a thousand stakeholder logos on one, one slide, so I did not do that, but um, this should give you a picture. We included investors of different types and from different markets and included uh, data providers and market builders, um, enterprises. And what we tried to understand through them was if we were to create a system that would really bring together all of these pieces, how should we make it um, so that it was most useful to the folks that needed it? And so based on all of that feedback, earlier this year, we launched Iris Plus, um, so in May. Iris Plus builds on all of that insight from all of those different conversations and offers uh, kind of a new level of value on top of the existing IRIS metrics. So IRIS Plus includes core metric sets. Uh, I'll talk about how those are, are developed, um, but they are designed to increase data clarity and comparability. It also pulls together um, all of the academic and field literature related to each of these spaces to make sure that investors are able to connect their approaches to the evidence supporting them. Um, it offers practical how-to guidance on things like how to collect data, how to use um, impact insights for decision-making around investments, and, uh, and finally, best-in-class resources. So looking through all of those 300-plus resources and through the system curating those that are going to be most relevant for each user. And of course, the, the IRIS catalog of metrics is still within the system. The system also pre-aligns with 50 standards and frameworks. I think it's actually 54 uh, frameworks now. And what that means is that whether you are aiming to use the system to, um, to report uh, GRI disclosures or to measure towards the 2X challenge or to the SDGs, 
Iris Plus allows you to align to all of those things in one common place. Um, and that's one of the, the most useful elements that we've heard um, investors at, since launch. So quickly, I'll discuss how we develop the themes and then I'm going to show you what's actually within Iris Plus. Um, and I'll anchor on this graphic at the bottom. So the way that we develop each theme and the way that we develop this gender lens theme was to first partner with uh, a deeply experienced actor within the space, in this case, Criterion Institute. And then through them and by engaging a broad group of stakeholders, uh, in this case, over 90 investors and market builders and evaluators, um, we look through the evidence existing and look at frameworks and best practices and develop a, a core set of content, which we then launch on the Navigating Impact Project. The Navigating Impact Project is the development platform for Iris Plus, and it allows us to get even more feedback through a public comment period. After all of that feedback, we take it in-house and we vet it and we standardize it and then ultimately launch it onto Iris Plus. So everything that you see in the Iris Plus system has been vetted by hundreds of different stakeholders over the course of its development. So it really does represent um, best practice and a balance of both practicality and rigor. So I will walk very quickly through the Iris Plus system. Um, this is Iris Plus. It's the generally accepted system for measuring, managing, and optimizing impact. And when you sign into Iris, it allows you to set up profiles according to your specific needs. So each one of these is customized for me. I set these up. Um, and I'll show you quickly how to create a new impact profile which is how you get to all of the content in Iris Plus. So when you click on that button, you're able to name the profile and you're able to say whether you'd like to enter the system through the SDGs or through the impact categories. Um, either will get you to the same content, it's just a matter of preference. Once I've selected, in this case, impact categories, it will ask me a couple of questions to help narrow down on the specific resources that it'll give me at the end. So here I've selected diversity and inclusion, gender lens, and then it asks me to be even more specific. So what am I trying to achieve? Um, I can select multiple of these, but for the simplicity's sake for this webinar, I'll just select reducing gender inequities in pay. So when I select that, right up front, it shows me which SDGs I'm most aligned to, and it also gives me a simple example of what investments in, are uh, in line with the strategic goal uh, are aiming to do. You'll see on the side, these tabs, the overview gives you a summary of what investments in that space look like and what evidence says is possible uh, through investments. Uh, it gives you a synthesized evidence base, and then it gives you the core metric set, which is what I just mentioned a second ago. This core metric set is a starter kit of metrics vetted by the industry and representing best practice around what to measure if you're aiming towards that goal. So instead of starting with a whole list of uh, lots and lots of metrics, it gives you a starting place. Um, and you can be confident that that is based on lots of feedback and lots of evidence. So it walks through a couple of key questions aligned to the five dimensions of impact. That includes uh, what is the goal you're trying to achieve? Who's affected? How much change is happening? What's the contribution you're making towards that larger goal? And what are the impact risks that you run as well as how is that change happening? I'll show you just really quickly what's inside each one of these indicators. So it gives you the clean indicator up front and then it tells you within why is this indicator important? What is the iris data necessary to get there? And exactly how do you calculate it? As I get down to the bottom, it also allows me to customize, which means that on top of this starter kit, I can add any additional metrics that are important for my practice and my specific investments. It also curates, you'll see here again on the, the side tabs, um, practical how-to guidance on how to approach impact measurement and management with a number of different uh, angles, and then a curated set of resources. So based on those questions that I answered, 
the system has uh, combed through all of the existing resources that we've cataloged and given me just those that are best practice and are most reflective of what I'm aiming to do. So you can see here that you get different uh, online tools for calculations. It gives you resource hubs. Sometimes there's databases. Um, it's really just whatever the industry has created that is most relevant. So that's Iris Plus, and I will end just by saying, um, oh, okay, nope, I'm going to skip the user reactions, particularly since Steve is on the line and they can tell you more. Um, there are a number of different learning and engagement opportunities coming up for Iris Plus. One that's not on this uh, slide is that we are just about to launch um, data collection for the evaluating impact performance study. You may have seen the most recent ones that we published on affordable housing and clean energy. Um, we're just about to launch two more uh, or data collection for them related to agriculture and financial inclusion. Um, so if you're interested in being involved, let me know. We are also just about to um, launch engagement on, oops, can't get to the next slide somehow. Um, on a couple of new themes that we're developing. And I'll note just very quickly that they are climate change mitigation and quality jobs, although all of these here um, are in constant refresh. So if you're, you're interested in being involved, do let us know. And with that, I believe I'm over time, so I'll pass it back to the AVPN team. Thank you very much, Lisa, for taking us through Jin's journey to address the common pain points in IMM and walking us through the IRIS Plus platform, as well as introducing uh, next steps all in the space of 15 minutes. I think um, you did a great job there. Now, um, on to Sif. Uh, Bob and Ingrid, over to you. You should now have control of the presentation, Ingrid. Um, let me know if you have any trouble. Bob and Ingrid? Great. Well, um, thank you all for joining and thank you AVPN for uh, really inviting us to, to make this presentation. We are, Steve is a proud Muted. of uh, both ABPN and, and the GIN. So it's it's great to be here and sharing our journey um, and our approach to uh, measuring gender lens um, equity within our within our, our portfolio companies. Uh, Ingrid, maybe we could go to the uh, agenda slide. Okay, well, what um, what we'd like to talk about today uh, is, one is a, a bit of an overview on SEEF itself, so you have a little bit of context. Um, then we'll talk about our, our own gender lens uh, investing journey. Uh, and from that, we've uh, developed our, our own particular gender lens investing thesis or investment strategy. And then of course, getting uh, to measurement, we wanna talk about our gender equality scorecard uh, what it is and, and show it uh, somewhat in action, if you will, in Southeast Asia, um, and talk a little bit about some of our investments in Southeast Asia, which is our gender lens investing pilot fund, and then talk about in more detail about our, our women's economic empowerment fund, uh, which we've now taken to market. Uh, we have not yet closed. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So. Uh, some of you may know SEEF, uh, some you may not, but uh, we were started in 1989 uh, back in, in Central Europe when the, when the wall came down. So we've been in business for 30 years. We are an impact uh, investment firm focused on emerging markets. We've managed over a billion dollars in capital. Uh, we've made over 400 investments and 75 investments of, of, of these have been what we would call investments that were aligned with our women's economic uh, empowerment uh, strategy. We are an SEC registered investment advisor. We're based in Washington, DC, um, but currently we have uh, 29 different global offices. And uh, I think we've operated in, in 30 something countries over our 30 years. Uh, we really have really embarked 
in earnest in our Gender Lens Investing journey about three years ago when we partnered with Investing in Women, as has already been mentioned, uh, with our pilot fund um, in, in Southeast Asia. And you can see here uh, the SDGs that are very important to us. Um, and of course, uh, with the schematic there, uh, a bit of our global presence. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit about our gender lens investing journey. Um, when I mentioned we've made 75 investments that, uh, if you will, in hindsight, are actually consistent with our current women's economic empowerment strategy. So we've, in effect, been practicing it for quite some time. But again, about three years ago, we really embarked in earnest. And this started with our SEEP Women's Opportunity Fund in Southeast Asia. It was funded by the Australian government. Uh, and the gender lens theme uh, or thesis was investing in women-led uh, SMEs. And we focused on Vietnam, the Philippines, and Indonesia. And by the, the close of this month, we'll have made six investments um, and done a lot of post-investment value creation work that is gender-based. Uh, since that time, we have uh, three things in play. One is we're on the verge of, of launching our global debt facility, uh, supporting uh, basically women's-led businesses or other gender themes. Uh, this will be this is a little bit a uh, bit of a preview, but uh, it's uh, we funded by OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, the DFI um, of the U.S. government, and our SEEP Women's Economic Empowerment Fund, which we're going to talk about a little bit later which we've taken to market and which basically we're building off, particularly the pilot fund, uh, this, the Women's Opportunity Fund. But what we really wanna talk about today is the what we've accomplished, which is the rollout of our gender equality scorecard, which we, we've now uh, applying to uh, every investment that we do anywhere in the world, which was an initiative that came out of that pilot fund or the SWAF we, we indicated up in the left. And similarly, how the GIN has worked with Criterion Institute. Uh, the Criterion Institute and Joy Anderson were very, very important partners of ours in developing uh, the scorecard. Uh, next slide, please. So when we started the pilot fund in Southeast Asia or the SWAF, the gender lens strategy and thesis was focusing on women-led businesses. From that work, uh, our team, both the global team and, and, and also in, in the region, thought that we could do more to benefit women uh, beyond uh, focusing just on women-led businesses. And so this strategy really had sort of the idea of creating shared value for entrepreneurs, for women, uh, and for investors in, in our funds by two ways. One is identifying latent value. In other words, identifying investment opportunities uh, in specific investment categories that with a gender lens, uh, th there's value to be realized there, again, for the three parties. And then secondly was post-investment and building value within those companies beyond, uh, shall I say, the, the, the normal value creation work that any private equity fund would do um, uh, if you could go back to the previous slide. There we go. Uh, building value post-investment, again, using a gender equality scorecard. So the uh, in identifying latent value, our current investment strategy, or gender lens investing strategy, is focusing on four uh, investment categories. Yes, women-led businesses like the pilot fund, uh, obviously, there are uh, women entrepreneurs that are underserved, and so if we can serve those entrepreneurs, there's latent value to be realized. Uh, the second category would be uh, companies that operate in sectors where women are particularly prevalent, uh, largely in the labor force. And the, the thinking there is that if we can promote gender equality within those companies, then that will create shared value. Uh, providing products and services uh, that meet the unmet needs and wants and aspirations of women and girls we think is underserved. Because it's underserved, that's an opportunity to create and build value. Um, and then those companies are already demonstrating a commitment to gender equality. Now, of course, if we're gonna to try to build value in those companies, 
or uh, identify that are all those that are already committed to gender equality, we have to find a way to, to basically is to determine that and to measure that. And that leads us to our gender equality scorecard. Okay, next slide, please. Great, so um, basically our, our, our scorecard is a rating tool and it does uh, uh, culminate in an overall rating, uh, but it's not really the number per se that we want to you know, make public, but it's a way to have a conversation with the company about gender equality and to track progress over time. That's basically the objective. So you see uh, six different uh, boxes here and we call them gender equality vectors. And each one of these vectors has factors underneath them, four in fact, um, by which we, we, we measure progress in these six gender equality vectors. So that includes workforce participation. In other words, uh, basically the level of, of women in the workforce. Uh, pay equity obviously is a very fam familiar uh, aspect. Leadership and governance, which of course uh, includes women in management. Uh, but not only management, but women in the cap table of companies or women that, that are represented as investors in the companies. Uh, benefits and professional development, career development, uh, work, workplace environment, which largely relates to different policies. Yes, things like sexual harassment, but also inclusion, occupational safety and environmental, uh, environmental uh, environment. Um, and then last but not least is women powered value chains. And what we mean by that is at a basic level, and hopefully we we'll want to develop it more, is women in the product design and sales teams, um, and also on the procurement side, because we think this has an opportunity to have impact uh, throughout the value chains. And of course, you know, we note IRIS here. Um, IRIS, we, we use for every investment we do, we use IRIS in general, um, very religiously. And I would also say that uh, there are many elements with regard to the, the, the gender metrics that are uh, consistent for sure uh, with our scorecard. And so with this, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ingrid. And next slide. Unmuted. Uh, Ingrid, I think you have to unmute yourself. Okay, I think um, under the circumstance, what I'll do, I'll just continue on here. So um, what you can see here is basically is a, a, a drill down, if you will, or a deep dive into the pay equity uh, gender equality vector. And of course, there's no way we're going to go through this in detail, but it's just an, a, a way to give you an idea uh, of how the different gender equality vectors work, in this case, pay equity. And you can see the underlying factors that feed into this, uh, which basically is comparing compensation at a, compensation at a ratio uh, level between uh, men and women in a company, also looking at the top 10% compensated employees and also looking at compensation policies and practices. So does the company have uh, basically policies that commit to pay equity and to making change within it? Um, and again, you all can get the, I think the presentation later and you can get into more detail, uh, but this is basically a specific example on this particular gender equality vector. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. All right, now, obviously in looking at this slide, there's, there's no way that you're going to digest it, um, but this actually is a specific example. It's you know, been anonymized. Uh, on the right hand, how we have uh, projected impact uh, with a particular investment, and you might be able to see iris metrics there in, in that great detail. Uh, but also in the lower right, uh, you can see a red box where we basically have set a, bench a benchmark for gender equality in this particular uh, company using the gender equality scorecard and what our aspiration is uh, to improve that uh, five years later. Now, uh, in order to improve this, we have to have to have an active value creation plan. 
And you can see in the lower left is a gender improvement plan. So there's a specific value creation activity based on the needs of the company in order to realize that aspirational improvement in the gender equality uh, in five years time. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with the pilot fund, the, the Women's Opportunity Fund that's been focusing on women-led businesses, uh, the more narrow gender lens theme that we started with uh, about almost three years ago. Uh, we're very, very pleased and excited about the investments we've made. Uh, everything from an OBGYN hospital in Vietnam, uh, four hours south of Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, there's basically an e-learning platform um, in, in Vietnam as well. Um, that provides really, uh, really important parental training and professional development training uh, for busy uh, working professionals and especially for women. Uh, Organica, which is a, 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 an organic food distributor and retail chain, um, and some other companies uh, that are noted here. Okay, next slide, please. So earlier we talked about um, the uh, CEF Women's Economic Empowerment Fund. Uh, which we've taken to market, and this is to build off all the work that really we've been doing, well, of course, over our 30 years, uh, but most recently over the past three years, building on the pilot fund. So we're looking to raise $100 billion. We're focusing on Southeast Asia uh, with these three core countries, but also doing on a select basis some of the other uh, countries in the region. And the, these orange boxes, uh, you can see the four uh, investment categories that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that we're looking to invest in, again, to create shared value for uh, entrepreneurs, for investors, uh, and also for women. Uh, next slide, please. Well, that's our thank you slide. And uh, Ingrid and I thank you so much for allowing us to, to make this presentation. We're really pleased to be here and look forward to some great questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bob, and uh, apologies, Ingrid, that we couldn't hear you. Um, that was a very insightful presentation, and it really helped to contextualize um, CIF's approach uh, to impact measurement and management, following on from Lisa's presentation. On that point, note, we will now take any questions you might have for Lisa or Bob. Please type your questions into the question box on your console, and on our end, we will assign the questions to the panelists as they come in. The first question um, that has come in, um, I think, is for Lisa. The question is, Lisa, addressing fragmentation is a challenge. At the same time, businesses and investors are interested in measuring impact and reporting them to their shareholders and stakeholders according to their various needs. Are there any insights on how Iris Plus can help in this context in terms of standardization versus addressing specific needs? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, so maybe a couple of points there. One of the values of Iris Plus and of a shift towards greater um, uh, comparability and a greater alignment in what we measure is that um, for some enterprises, particularly those getting multiple sources of, of capital, it can actually help to streamline the asks of them. What One of the things we hear from uh, a number of enterprises is that um, in getting capital from a number of different sources, they're often asked to report on many, many different types of uh, indicators. So by helping drive the, the market towards uh, a common set, we are effectively helping those um, those enterprises start with kind of a, a core set of metrics and then um, have their investors aligned according to that. And there's still always going to be some additional indicators that need to be collected, but it's a, a step in the right direction of making things a little bit more uh, simplified for them. On the investor level, it's a great point. Um, 
What we've heard is that it's very valuable to have a starter kit, but that no starter kit um, is going to be sufficient to measure everything for any particular investor, which is why we ended up creating that um, the customized function within uh, within the system. So it allows you to actually build in a, a more custom set of metrics depending on your particular needs, which can help address that um, that need to report different types of information to different stakeholders. Um, the other thing I would mention is that to facilitate some of that conversation between different actors, um, we, we just released a new functionality on the system that allows you to, um, to have uh, to set up a core metric set and then share it externally. So what we've seen this used mostly for is um, between investors and enterprises, allowing them to kind of, uh, an investor, for example, could set up a, a core metric set and share it with an enterprise as a means of having that conversation around what's important, or it could go the other way. So an enterprise could create their own. Um, I'll stop there. I'm hoping that I address the question, but if not, let me know and I'll circle back. Um, thank you, Lisa. Bob, did you have anything to add on? Um, well, I think it, it is a great question, and I would just quickly say, because I'm sure there's other questions, that it, it, for some it definitely is a, a challenge. I would say for CIF, um, the way that we design funds and take them to market and the capital providers that we talk with, uh, it hasn't been an issue for us, but it's something that we're mindful of. Um, but at the moment, it it's not an issue for us. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is for you, Bob. Um, the question is, what is the process of selecting and aligning impact metrics to an investment thesis? And does CIF provide technical assistance support uh, to help companies do this? Interesting. Um, so uh, I think there are two questions there. Um, one is, uh, could you repeat that for me, the first one? The first one is, what is the process of selecting and aligning the impact metrics to your investment thesis? How do you do that? And the second one well, is about whether you support the organizations that you invest in in becoming um, able uh, to do this. <clears throat> Well, I would say that uh, we've had 40 funds in our 30 years, and uh, most of these funds have been what we would call sector agnostic, mm -hmm. although more recently over the last couple of years, uh, particularly with the movement of high net worth individuals and foundations and so forth into the space, we started to develop more impact theme funds like the Women's Economic Empowerment Fund. So for the former, the agnostic funds, our impact approach, and this is in our in our design documentation and our PPMs and so forth to investors, we have three core impact performance metrics, which are uh, quality jobs, uh, taxes paid, and, and revenues, in fact, because we think they drive impact, with the expectation that they, there's usually a thematic impact theme for each investment that fund would do, again, for a sector agnostic fund. So that's pretty standard approach for those types of funds. For the more impact theme funds like clean energy or a gender lens fund or a health fund, um, you know, then we would uh, we generally would develop, uh, you know, researching the market using the the IRIS framework for sure. Uh, uh, some impact uh, themed metrics around that theme, so around health and so forth, and it would definitely be in the design and creation uh, phase and. I don't think I've really shed any deep insight there, but I, I did want to sort of split it into two different types of funds that we would do. One that's sector agnostic, where there's a pretty uh, standard set. And then if there's an impact theme, uh, you know, it depends on the country, it depends on the interest of investors uh, and things like that. Now on the second question, if I understood it correctly, basically when we make an investment in a company, uh, do we help that company with, uh, uh, I, I guess you would say, defining the impact, uh, managing the impact, measuring the impact, and, and taking some lessons learned from that. And I would say that is definitely true. Um, I would say also that when we make an investment, what's very important to us is that the impact is inherent in the business model. So generally speaking, those metrics are things that they would track anyway as part of the business. 
And one example would be if we invested in an agro processor that sourced from smallholder farmers, for example, then an impact play there could, could you know, easily be the income to those farmers, the number of those farmers, um, but that type of information the company would already have. And if they didn't have it, then we would help uh, build off the system to make sure they could track it. Great, Bob, that was a really comprehensive answer. Uh, Lisa, you had something to add? Oh yeah, I would just add that um, I think Bob covered um, a really great example or a couple of them. Um, if anybody is interested in another, um, a, a little bit longer and more drawn out um, example, we actually just did an Iris Plus uh, webinar with Nuveen where they they focused on this quite a bit. So they walked through the process of how um, they connected their impact thesis to metrics via Iris Plus. Um, so that's on our website if anybody's interested. Great. Um, next question. Uh, is there, I think this is for you, Lisa, is there an ability in Iris Plus to specify the size of the business that you're investing in is, as ticket sizes across organizations uh, vary greatly? And one funder may be funding multiple areas with multiple NGO partners. So is there a way of understanding a cumulative impact value? Um, at the moment, no. Iris Plus really isn't designed to be um, any sort of matchmaker or to, to show data at this point on um, what individual investors or, or users are doing. We are working on a, a way for folks that opt in to be able to share a little bit more about their investments and which, um, which strategic goals and metrics they're using, but um, at the moment the system's not set up to do that. Okay, uh, great. So, question for Bob now. Uh, you mentioned an active value creation plan to reach impact goals. Uh, can you give examples of um, how to how to do this and what organizational levels and components are touched through this process? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know. Investors in a fund, any fund that SEEP would have or any other fund, uh, whether they're impact you know, capital providers or otherwise, are very increasingly focused on value creation work post-investment. And if you think, you know, besides impact, that's everything from uh, financial management systems, cash flow planning, uh, marketing strategy, governance, uh, building out the human resource platform, and so forth. So what you could call conventional post-investment value creation work. And that's very important to see. Uh, we've been doing that uh, quite rigorously over our 30 years. And generally, you know, financial management uh, is a big part of that. Now, when you get to impact, um, and you know, we've we got a limited time here, I would say two things. One is, um, because we believe that impact generally, and we can put um, gender equality uh, on the side for the moment, uh, impact is inherent in the business model for the companies that we invest in. And that means as the company scales and becomes more successful, that the impact uh, uh, grows right along with it. And the example that I gave for smallholder farmers, if that's part of the business model sourcing from smallholder farmers, then hopefully that's you know, self-evident uh, that it's inherent in the business model. So if we do our traditional value creation work, then, then we will be having a direct impact on in, uh, impact on impact. Now, if you think about gender and the gender equality scorecard, now that's a little bit different and needs to be a little bit more tailored. So, and one of the things, and, and Ingrid's been doing some great work on this uh, for us, is uh, developing. Um, uh, you know, I touched on policies, right, in our gender equality scorecard on pay equity. Well, all the other vectors have some form of a policy development exercise. So having a policy, uh, communicating the policy, assessing the policy over time, uh, and taking action based on uh, the results from the policy. Now, when I say a policy, pay equity, uh, compensation, um, uh, and, and other policies that I mentioned. So it, in that case, our value creation work is helping the companies 
develop gender smart policies, whether it's pay equity, whether it's in recruitment, whether it's in uh, environmental policy, uh, whether it's in benefits and so forth. And that's where in particular with regard to impact, our value creation work is a little bit different uh, than our conventional value creation work where it benefits companies where impacts in, inherent in the business model. So limited time, but I hope that's helpful. And of course, delighted to have follow-up questions now or you know, even you know, offline as it were after this webinar. Great. Um, as we wait for follow-up questions to come in, uh, one question back to Lisa um, about the metrics. The metrics-based results are obviously not only highly dependent on the framework, um, such as Iris Plus itself, but as just as much on the data that is put in. How do you engage with members to address the issue of collecting quality data? Um, that is a beautiful question because we are just about to put out um, uh, I, what I think is a, a very useful, very practical guide on how to collect data in a number of different settings. Um, we're partnering with the CDC group to develop that. I'm hoping it will be out by the end of the, the year, um, but if not, it'll be early next year. And I, I think that that will be um, quite useful to folks broadly, but also specifically to folks who are using Iris Plus and want to be using it um, to collect quality data. Um, and that, of course, aligns to a lot of the work that's come out in the past year, uh, aligned with the IFC's principles of impact measurement and management as well. And thank you for the chance to, to mention that. Great. Um, Bob, how about for you? Does this issue affect you too? I believe it would. Um, could you repeat the question, please? So the, the question is around um, the metrics that are highly dependent not only on the framework, but the quality of the data that comes in. Um, and how do you uh, engage uh, to address the issue of data quality? Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, how do you assess the, the quality of the data? Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that um, there are several ways that we do that so first of all we you know generally speaking of course this is self-reported data right generally speaking and i did mention about our core impact performance metrics jobs revenues and taxes paid i did talk about you know each company typically has its own impact uh, or or thematic specific uh, metric like uh, smallholder farmers uh, and i've talked about our gender quality scorecard but beyond that there are actually about 40 different metrics that we track, um, and, and virtually all of them are, are from the IRIS uh, Plus uh, framework one way or the other. But these are self-reported. These numbers are self-reported. Now, it's the job of our deal teams on the ground to ground truth those, those, those numbers. So, um, and, and it's, it, it, of course, it varies by company, and it varies by team, and it varies by locale. But basically, the self-reported and what we ask our deal teams is to ground truth those numbers. And then we have an impact team uh, here based in Washington that's charged with making sure all this collection happens, uh, inputting the, and aggregating the data, uh, and also having their own check um, on the data. And uh, you know, we do not have at this stage uh, an independent party coming in and verifying the data, uh, because as you might imagine, uh, essentially that would be an audit, any audit, you know, it costs money to do that, um, and that's that's the big challenge, right? Absolutely. Uh, multiple levels of alignment necessary to ensure that we are really getting effective and um, real truthful numbers around impact. Thank you both, uh, Lisa and Bob. That's all the time we have for questions, unfortunately. Um, but if there are any other questions, that come up, uh, please do email us at knowledge at avpn.asia and we will forward them on to the speakers accordingly. Uh, thank you also to Lisa and Bob and um, Ingrid, although we couldn't hear you, um, you, have, you were there and you did put in 
uh, for your slides. <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing your expertise and your your journeys with us. The thank you. Recording of the webinar will be posted on the ABPN website by next week, so please look out for it. Um, and before we end, uh, please be informed of the following avenues to continue your engagement with Gender Lens Investing with ABPN. Um, first would be ABPN's deal share platform, which is available at avpn.asia slash dealshare platform where you can find a number of social purpose organizations working towards gender equality in Asia. You might also be interested in joining us at the upcoming AVPN Southeast Asia Summit which will be held from 12th to 14th February 2020 in Bali and gender lens investing is going to be a major theme during the panel discussions, workshops, and breakout sessions there. You can register for the summit on the AVPN website. On that note, thank you to all our speakers and all our participants, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar or event. Thank you very much.